And today, uh, this afternoon, we have the first talk of the year. We're thrilled to host Brian Porter Schutz, who needs no introduction. He's one of ours. Uh, he's the Turnout Professor of History. He's a highly accomplished scholar of uh, Polish history and Eastern Europe. His first book, uh, When uh, Nationalism Began to, to Hate, uh, is now a classic. It's been translated into Polish. His se second book, um, which was entitled Faith and Fatherland, Catholicism, Modernity, and Poland, uh, published by Oxford in 2010, won the Kolczycki Book Prize from ACES. Uh, he has a third book recently published, um, which is called Poland in the Modern World, Beyond Martyrdom. In 2014, this book is, was written to have a broader appeal. So this is a wonderful book for everyone, scholars, students, and people in the real world, as we say. Uh, and it's a book that has been receiving excellent press. Um, we're especially happy also that Brian is uh, giving the first lecture, uh, the first crease lecture of the year, um, because we have two series um, that will shape many of the conversations we will have this year. One is on populism, and the other one is on regionalism. So you will see that we will have increase, but also the CES, uh, the Center for European Studies, CPPS, um, and uh, the Wiser Center for Emerging Democracies. We've been working together to have lectures that actually overlap and talk to each other, regardless of region. And uh, Brian will be speaking today um, on populism, in Poland. He's going to problematize populism. The talk is entitled The Polish Radical Right and the Return of National Communism in Poland. He's just coming back from a sabbatical year where he lived in Warsaw and has been observing and participating in some of the major upheavals, political, legal, uh, and social upheaval of the last year. And today he's going to be giving us his interpretation and analysis of that, but also reports from the field. And we're very thankful for this and um, welcome again and we look forward to seeing you throughout the year. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you Genevieve for that nice introduction, all the nice plugs for my book available at whatever, if, any, if there are any bookstores near you left, it's available <laughs> there I imagine. Uh, I apologize for my title. Uh, you know, asked to come and give the first lecture in a series on populism. And the first thing I do is I, th I don't actually believe in populism. I don't think it's a good word. I don't think we should be talking about it. And so today I'm going to explain to you why, uh, which is a great way to start a series on popula populism. I also apologize because problematizing as the very first word of the year that in your increased talk that you're being exposed to is like I'm fulfilling every academic stereotype here. <laughs> Uh, but that is kind of what I want to do, and it, it is alliterative, so whatever. In all seriousness, I do think that a word of caution is uh, in order if we're going to be talking about popul populism, because the word has some, some problems, some historical problems, some analytical problems, and some practical political problems problems. Uh, the first problem is that, and I'm sure I'm hardly the first person to note this, it's an awfully capacious term. Right? Populism has been used, in the press at least, to cover groups as uh, wildly diverse as, uh, as Syriza in, uh, or Podemos uh, or you know, the Bernie Sanders movement, uh, Jeremy Corbyn on the one hand to uh, the peace, law and justice movement in Poland, Viktor Orban's Fidesz uh, uh, in, in Hungary, or even, um, even the Trump regime. Uh, if there is a concept that is meant to encompass both Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, I think it's one that is going to have to be pretty vague and not terribly analytically useful. But that's actually not my biggest problem here. More important for me as a historian is a very specific problem, and that is that the word populism has a long historical tradition that really has very little to do with the way it's being used now. And this is particularly relevant when we look at a site like Poland. In Poland, there has long been a populist party. The term uh, in Polish is ludowe. Uh, now, 
in contemporary Polish, there is another word, populistyczne, but that is a neologism uh, designed to make a distinction between populism and populism. Uh, but the, uh, it, etymologically, they are the same word. Lud means the people. Uh, so Ludowy is, 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 um, is, is populist. It really is the same thing. Um, and more generally, throughout um, East Central Europe, other parts of the world as well, in Latin America, certainly, there's a long tradition of, uh, of a certain type of agrarian movement that has borne the label populist. Right, uh, and this is something that is has a very specific intellectual tradition and genealogy uh, with uh, with a certain ideology that really has nothing to do with the way the word is being uh, being used. And so, not only do we have a word that is vague in its current day usage and meant to encompass this incredibly wide variety of uh, political movements, but we have one that has a historical root that we must ignore in order to talk about it today in the way it's being used in the press. And so, this creates all sorts of problems. And finally, in some ways, this might be the most, uh, most important thing, at least for me personally, not professionally. But that is, there's, there's a, a political risk in making too much of this term populism. If we imagine that the dividing line in our world today is between populist and anti-populist, or whatever we'll call the other side, then we end up with a situation where we have all of these clusters of parties, some which we might like, some which we might despise, on one side of the, uh, the ledger. And on the other side of the ledger, we got money and degrees. Right? We have the elites. And if, uh, if we're going to treat seriously populism as a political concept as well as an analytical concept, then what we're doing is we're just uh, setting ourselves up for, uh, for a, a, a losing battle, to, uh, and one that I wouldn't want to fight, right? Uh, it's not, I don't think uh, it's, a, uh, it's a viable way uh, or an analytically useful way to divide up the political spectrum. So if populism isn't helpful as a way to talk about the people we want to talk about and are looking for a name for. What should we use instead? Well, I don't have an answer to that question. Um, or to put, it more, to put it more clearly, I don't have a good answer for that question. I have a bad answer. A bad answer because I've got a, an explanation and I've got a description for you, but I don't have a label yet. Not one that actually can be uh, uh, you know, eloquently used. But so let's just bracket the name <laughs> to be determined and focus in on, uh, on the issue itself. Who are these people? Uh, well, I trust you probably know who most or all of them are. But uh, uh, you know, what is the, the thing that they represent, that they illustrate? So to, um, to, 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 to dig down into this, I'm going to focus, obviously, on the, the one I know best, and that's this guy, Jarosław Kaczynski, and um, the peace movement in Poland, uh, the acronym for Law and Justice. Just a little background for those of you who haven't been following Polish events. In 2015, Law and Justice swept to power in a political wave that now seems familiar, because we've seen it happen in a lot of other places too, but at the moment was, uh, was quite startling, uh, extremely startling. Uh, I remember in um, so late April, finishing up the 2015 winter semester here at U of M, I was teaching my modern Polish history class, very last day of class. I said, there are very few things uh, that I can, I, I can ever you know, predict with any confidence, because you know historians uh, are usually loath to be prophets, but I can, with like 100% confidence, predict and tell you that in one month's time, when there are elections in Poland, incumbent President Bronisław Komorowski will be elected in a landslide for a second term. <laughs> this is by way of saying you really shouldn't take anything I say too seriously. <laughs> Um, in my defense, a lot of people felt the same way, uh, said the same thing, and they had reason, we had reason for doing so. Uh, as in January of 2015, uh, Komorowski had an approval rating of 72% um, and a disapproval rating of only 17%. 
this was the most popular president in uh, Poland's, uh, Poland's history, probably. Um, the uh, surveys from uh, January, same time, uh, also, um, you know, it's easy to have a popularity, unpopularity, but how you do in an election, of course, is a is a one-to-one -one thing. So in uh, surveying people on some hypothetical political matchups, no matter how they ran it, he got at least 65% of the vote against any candidate in January of 2015. The elections were scheduled for May. I, I think you can be pretty confident under that situation. Well, that's not how things turned out, though. Not, not at all. In the first rounds of the presidential election in May, uh, Komorowski actually came in second place to a man that most people had not even heard of um, six months earlier, uh, at, um, Andrzej Duda. To describe this as surprising uh, is the understatement uh, of the year. A survey that uh, another survey from earlier in the year asked, um, asked people about their trust or mistrust of a variety of pu prominent public figures, politicians in Poland. And you can see Komorowski's uh, number over there. He's got the largest, by far, uh, yellow line, the trusted line of anybody there. Um, uh, it, um, his trustworthy was, trustworthiness was like off the charts. Right? Uh, Duda, meanwhile, had uh, just been added to the survey. They've been run, they run the survey every I don't know if it's every quarter or, or, or twice a year. I don't remember with what frequency, but this is a long-running um, survey. Duda was virtually unknown, so lots of unknowns there, lots of I don't know, I don't have an opinion, uh, one way or the other. Um, meanwhile, on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, the leader of the law and justice movement as the third most uh, untrusted man in the entire country. And the only reason that he's in third place is because uh, they also put on the, uh, on the list here two political gadflies that, uh, that piss off just about everybody. Um, uh, and he's the first like, legitimately serious uh, politician uh, uh, to be on the chart. And he is incredibly untrusted, um, tr trusted by few, mistrusted by many. Moreover, dig in a little deeper, guess who's right behind him? His, his two primary lieutenants, the two other main figures in the law and justice movement. So, you know, you've got basically the entire leadership of the law and justice movement, real, the real leadership of the party, sitting there uh, among the most untrusted, disliked people in the entire country. You have their presidential candidate as an unknown against the most popular president in Polish history. Of course, the result is that the president lost and the peace candidate won. Uh, the, uh, so, um, the overall popularity of the party has all, a peace, uh, has always been uh, lowish uh, on the, oh, roughly in the, you know, upper 20s or lower 30s. At times they've peaked into the mid 30s, but um, basically this is where their popularity has. Now, you can see a slight, if you, if you squint, you can see uh, a growth in their popularity uh, as we move into 2015, um, especially a little spurt there towards the end of the year. Uh, but if you, you know, th there's a lot of variation in the surveys and no matter how we uh, fudge the numbers, you have an average popularity um, uh, between 20, 20, 2007 and 2015, an average popularity for this party of 23% of the population. Um, now that, that probably makes it too low. They were gaining in support, but there's still a long way to go. Meanwhile, the other big party in Poland, a centrist, probably by most standards center-right party, although by the nature of the dynamics of having peace out there, they were getting pushed into slightly the, 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 the vaguest center-left position, is civic platform which uh, at almost no, at, at, but, but for one tiny brief moment between 2007 and 2015, they were the largest and most popular political party in the country. Granted, well under 50%, except for one little moment there back in 2008. Uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise well below 50%, but still, still doing okay. Uh, and they had dipped uh, here in 2013, 2015, but a pretty visible recovery there as we move closer towards the elections. Their average popularity during this extended block of time uh, was 35% support. So you have 
this looking over the period from 2007 to 2015, you have Peace averaging 23% and Civic Platform averaging 35%. Uh, it's easy to forget now, but a lot of us were saying, uh, look at this, this is amazing. Poland now has a strong, stable, liberal consensus. Liberal in the European sense of the word. Sort of centrist consensus. Uh, <laughs> that didn't seem to turn out to be the case. So Komorowski barely campaigned. Uh, in part, looking at all those numbers, it didn't seem necessary. Uh, that was certainly a political blunder. I don't want to attribute everything to that. A lot of people in Poland today blame Komorowski for what, has hap what happened and what has happened because of his uh, failure to fight more for his, himself and his party. Um, whatever, he did not campaign much and certainly not very vigorously uh, and certainly not in a way that was going to appeal to uh, you know, a, a 2015 electorate. His social media presence was almost non-existent, for example. Uh, and in the, um, once we get to the um, second round of the election, there was the first round and then in the second round he lost. He lost by three percentage points. This had confirmed this event in the spring of 2015 confirmed the tactical decisions of Yaroslav Kaczynski and the other leaders, the other leaders, there are no, there are no other leaders of law and justice. Yaroslav Kaczynski, it's a very authoritarian party. Uh, it confirmed the, uh, the, stra the, the strategy of this party to basically hide the leadership of the party uh, who were widely disliked, keep them out of the main uh, spotlight and allow uh, uh, unknown front people to stand forward. This is, the, um, this is the strategy that they then pursued in the lead up to the parliamentary elections, which were also in 2015, uh, later that same year, in October. Um, so for the summer of 2015, Kaczynski himself, most importantly, but also, uh, he, also Antony Macarevich, um, uh, who uh, in the expat community uh, uh, in Warsaw is referred to as Mad Match, uh, Machadevich, um, him and, uh, and uh, Zbigniew Jobro uh, were un invisible. They, you couldn't even get, in, nobody could get interviews with them. They did not speak publicly except in extremely safe audiences uh, and very small ones at that. Uh, they stayed out of the news. Uh, the, uh, the Peace Party platform uh, was, uh, was really stripped of almost everything the party had expressed its belief in. Instead, they campaigned on uh, an anti-corruption platform always effective, whatever your political orientation, uh, and, uh, and, some, uh, and, and some social programs, uh, which actually had uh, quite a, lo a lot of, of, of broad support and were not even their ideas. With that, the polls started to swing. Uh, the surveys started to swing. This is very hard to talk about in Polish history. The surveys started to swing. Uh, so that uh, by the time we get you know, to the presidential elections and then increasingly throughout the summer, uh, uh, it looks increasingly inevitable that peace would emerge as the largest political party. <clears throat> now, there was obviously a growing dissatisfaction with the, the incumbent party. That, is, that, is not, that can't be doubted. Um, but most of the drain away from them, most of the people who had been supporters of uh, Civic Platform, uh, most of that drain went to a new liberal party with a very, very similar ideological profile, a party called, I guess we'd translate it, modernity, Novochesna. Uh, and th you know, the differences between the two in an ideological sense could be identified, but I don't even want to talk about that because they're so minor as to not really matter. A lot of people would, could switch their votes from one to the other easily. What we don't see, didn't, didn't see, and haven't seen, is uh, a flood, uh, a, a, a sway of voters or supporters uh, from any, either of those two main liberal parties, uh, center-right parties, center-left parties, centrist parties, uh, from them to peace. We've not seen that. that. That has not been happening. So the depiction that one often, that one often sees, and this is a point I really want to emphasize, of, uh, of Poland turning to the right is actually highly misleading because there is, as I'll show you uh, with more detail, uh, has been only the very slightest uh, uh, of changes 
in the makeup of the sort of uh, ideological profile of the population of the country. Um, enough to change the electoral results, um, but this was a highly, as we would say in history, highly contingent set of developments. The real factor, um, the real factor that uh, was decisive, it turned out, in the uh, elections of 2015, the parliamentary elections of 2015, is one that uh, has received almost no discussion, even in, in Poland. Um, but actually was, uh, when you look at the um, election results, uh, the numbers, when you look at the, the, the actual numbers, it, it turns out was huge. And that is the collapse of the left. And this actually is a pattern that we've seen uh, elsewhere as well. The main thing that allowed Viktor Orban to rise to power was the utter uh, uh, destruction of the Social Democrats in Hungary. Uh, and uh, here there's a very similar phenomenon in Poland. The old, uh, um, so here's, here's uh, the election results, not the, not the division of the parliament. These are the, just the election results, voters, uh, in, in the uh, October election. As you can see, you have a uh, large um, right-wing bloc with uh, peace at 38%, and then um, a rock star turned politician kind of uh, named uh, Pavel Kukis, uh, who also got uh, another 8% of the vote. Um, and this, as I can talk about if you wish, is a, is a very familiar picture. It brings us up to around in the 40s or something that have consistently supported uh, one or another right-wing party over the past 25 years. Um, but the, um, the, the real story, as it would turn out, would be there on the left. What was happening on the left? Well, the Union of the Democratic Left, Soyuz Levitsi Demokratichny, or SLD, uh, it was the party that emerged out of the rubble of the Communist Party uh, in, uh, after the fall of communism in 1989 and uh, had quite a good run until they didn't. Uh, as you can see, they, they, again, like the case in Hungary, uh, corruption scandals, not surprisingly because the party did consist uh, largely of party apparatchiks from, from the, the communist era. Uh, so it, it was uh, an institution that did have some, some corruption issues, to say the least. Um, more, more importantly, though, it, it, was a, it was a political party that people could not identify. So it had this word socialism in its name uh, and then eventually just left, uh, really cutting ties with any socialist tradition. Uh, and more importantly, um, having a political message which was very hard ideologically to identify. Uh, there was, I remember one survey, that was in the early aughts, uh, in which they asked people, uh, which social group does SLD represent? And the results were divided almost evenly between the new elites of Poland, the old elites of Poland, um, I have no idea, or least of all, last on the list, the poor. Uh, so this is a left-wing party that people can't even ideologically identify. Uh, and if they do, the last thing they're likely to say is it represents the underprivileged. Uh, so it, 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 when corruption scandals broke, it didn't take much. It was just, whoo, and down goes the party. What's interesting uh, though, is that, uh, and, and, and problematic, is that nothing has yet, at least yet, come in to take its place. Um, th th there, was a, um, there, there was a new um, uh, left-wing party created before the last elections. They're called Together, or Razem. Uh, and uh, the, um, you know, there are many jokes about that name, because together is the last thing they are, actually, they're in terms of uh, organizational coherence. Uh, but they, they, they're some, some uh, buddy figured this out, that uh, the, be the best predictor of where you could find a party headquarters for Razem was to look at the distribution of Starbucks in Poland. Uh, th th this was a, a I, I, I know a lot of people in this group, I admire them. Uh, in many ways, but, uh, but their political footprint is very small and will likely remain so. They're very, it's, a very, it's a group of young people for the most part who are very serious, very uh, well-intentioned, but also uh, almost entirely living in, uh, in Poland's urban areas uh, with very little contact beyond that. Now, 
even all of this <laughs> would not have been enough. Even the total collapse, organizationally collapse, of the left would not have been enough to have uh, given peace power. Had the leaders of SLD not made a fundamental tactical mistake, one that they had been making actually for a number of elections in a row. SLD technically is not a party. It is a coalition. And to make matters worse, they went into this, elec this election in, in 2015 creating an even broader coalition. Now the rules of the Polish uh, election uh, uh, are that in order to get into parliament, to get any seats in parliament, you have to get at least 5% of the vote. If you do not get 5% of the vote, your, anybody who voted, your votes are then distributed proportionally among the parties that did get 5% of the vote. There's a, there's a twist to that, though. If you go into the election as a coalition instead of as a single party, you have to get 8% of the vote. So this united left coalition got 7.5. As if they had organized as a party, even particularly if they could have gotten Razum together, not truly together, uh, and gone as a left bloc, they would have actually been the third largest political party in the country after this election, if they put it all together. They did not, and as a result, they got no votes at all in the actual Polish Sejm. Totally shut out. Um, I, uh, I, it's, it's hard to do these calculations, but uh, if, if, my, uh, if my math is correct, and I am a historian, so it might not be, if my math is correct, if 65,000 additional voters had supported um, the United Left Coalition in one part of the country, then they would have surpassed the 8% um, threshold, gotten into parliament, peace would not have had a majority, and would not be in government now, and nothing that we're talking about would have happened. Right. So this is, this is really, really important. Um, this is what we end up with because of this nature of the electoral system. This is the parliament. It, you note that this chart does not look like the last one. Uh, the Polish parliament looks like a world in which peace has, dominates the country, represents the majority, as they constantly claim that they do, uh, and uh, that their victory symbolizes and signifies a fundamental shift in the nature of the Polish electorate and tells us something important about the Polish population. It does not. Okay? Whether you support peace or you don't support peace, if you're clear-headed about this, you have to recognize that a teensy, tiny shift in votes mostly not by anybody changing their votes, but by a few people voting who sat out previous elections and a few people who had voted in previous elections sitting out this one. And by few, I mean like in the tens of thousands uh, in a country of 38 million, uh, it could have gone in a completely different way right? uh, because of the nature of the electoral math. So that, that, is really, that is really an important thing to keep in mind, uh, that if we're trying to explain why all of this has happened, and, and you know, I, I'm sure uh, a similar story can be told in the United States, right? We are not talking about major shifts in the nature of our world in terms of attitudes. Uh, we are talking about minor political shifts that lead to massive power grabs, right? And so that changes the way we build any explanation for what's going on. Right? So you start with an explanation saying, oh, it's because of the economy. It's because of these certain developments in big macroeconomic issues or demographic issues or whatever. That is very unlikely to be persuasive because the actual shifts in the voting population are just too small. OK, so if we, if we look. Um, Historically, uh, over the past, uh, uh, over the, this cent the whole century, uh, what we see is that support for peace, they are the black line uh, there, I'm sorry, actual votes. These are not surveys, these are actual votes. Um, that yes, it has increased a little, a very little when we put it alongside the total uh, population, total eligible voters, uh, and even when we set it alongside the votes cast. These are minor changes. Uh, it went, they went down and they went up. What's very interesting, particularly, is to compare it to 2007. If at uh, 2007, uh, they lost. Moreover, 
in the 2007 election, everyone was saying that, uh, that the center liberal party civic platform had triumphed as that headline, that, uh, that uh, Poland had entered a new era of liberal consensus, peace was gone for good. Uh, this has shown that that sort of right wing uh, group was not going to be popular in Poland. Uh, they were doomed. Well, they got almost the identical number of votes in 2015. Almost the same number of people voted for them. Right? Uh, now we say Poland has been transformed and revealed that it's, uh, the true desire of the Polish people is, uh, is, is, this, is this nationalist, xenophobic, authoritarian political movement. It just is not so. So this is important. So the causes of the victory of peace in 2015 are highly contingent, not to say almost random. I mean, when you're talking a difference of 60, 70,000 votes, you know, bad weather can lead to that much of a swing in an electorate, right? So we are talking about an almost random set of developments that brought peace to parliamentary power. There are no deep, there were no deep social or ideological transformations in the Polish society leading up to any of this. So the causes we have to look to the historically contingent. The effects are massive. The effects extend far beyond uh, the set of very specific events that led up to this party's rule. I probably don't need to go into too much detail uh, for this room about exactly uh, what has happened over the past two years. Um, just to sort of recap, uh, once in power, the, uh, the, the leaders of law and justice, Jarosław Kaczynski, and the two most prominent sort of popular politicians, in popular inside the party, politicians, Antony Macerewicz and uh, Zbigniew Jobro, uh, they uh, emerged from the shadows immediately. Uh, the uh, person that had run as the prime minister candidate, a person, again, that no one had ever heard of before the elections, a, a woman named Bata Shidwo, uh, was in fact named prime minister. So they did that much. Uh, in an interview, immediately after the elections, someone said, so are you going to make Antony Macerewicz the defense minister as, as he hopes to become? And she said, of course not, you know, because that would be crazy. Well, the next day, Antony Macerewicz, Macerewicz became defense minister. Uh, so you, that right away, it was made clear the prime minister is not the person you need to go to if you want to know anything about what is happening in this country. Uh, equally so, the president, uh, although he has been maybe developing a little bit of spying. We'll talk about that in a moment. In any case, what happened over the coming uh, months very quickly showed where this new government was going. Uh, one of the first steps was a, a very thorough purge of the civil services, thousands, perhaps more, uh, of people uh, throughout the country in various uh, uh, bureaucratic offices were fired uh, in every branch of government in every office. Um, virtually every position of power going quite deep to the local level uh, was turned over. Uh, the state media, was uh, transformed, let me, sorry, the state media, Televizia Polska, um, we talk about this and Americans can sometimes get a little confused because you think, oh, public TV, yeah, you know, that, that's, that's what, you know, all 10 of us watch. Um, that's not the case in Poland. The, uh, the, the public media was, in fact, the largest media uh, in the country, and it is a media system, both uh, uh, Polish radio, uh, Polish TV, the Polish press agency, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a broad media empire. Um, now here in the US, we are uh, used to talk, complaining about uh, media bias. It's, it's, an, it's a complaint that one sees on the left and the right. We don't know media bias. <laughs> uh, even the, uh, you know, I, I, I thought I would never say anything like this, but even Fox News uh, uh, comes forward as a pluralistic and reliable information source compared to what has happened to uh, TVP, uh, which, uh, as these uh, cartoons suggest, uh, is perhaps TVP Pinocchio, uh, TVP Peace, um, uh, uh, or um, uh, then this is some others that are less family friendly. Uh, they, the, the point being that, um, that, that this, this 
what you see on Polish uh, public television now is, is shocking, is shocking. And the only comparison in, in, in my experience is in fact the uh, television that used to run uh, back in the 1980s uh, that I remember during communist times where the media, every, every you know, news show, for example, will start with what the prime minister did today and show some nice uh, picture of, uh, of, of, uh, of the prime minister kissing babies or shaking hands with workers or some such thing. Uh, then there will be a, a piece about the, uh, the, the pernicious opposition, which of course is run by hoodlums and criminals uh, and financed by unknown foreign sources. Uh, and then, finally, there is almost invariably something to scare you uh, ending up the show. It uh, usually will be something about how the Muslims are about to take your babies. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's vulgar in that way. It is, it is not subtle. It is not biased. It is propaganda in the most sort of non-academic and uh, colloquial sense of that word. Um, Back in uh, 2012, so before any of this happened, there was a survey. Oh, here we go. There's some, some viewer, viewership data. So Tefalpe is the blue line there. And you can see that they ha had and continue to have uh, the, uh, the largest uh, viewership of the three major networks that show news programming. Uh, I guess if one good thing that's happened is more people are paying attention to the news than used to, uh, if that's a good thing. So in 2012, they, they ran a, uh, somebody ran a survey asking people uh, what they thought about the ideological profile of the main television networks. The public network, TVP, uh, um, TVN, which is uh, uh, their, the main uh, competitor, and then also Polsat, which is slightly smaller but also significant. And what you could see is that very few people, almost nobody, thought that any of them were pro-government at that time. This is previous to peace coming to power. Um, the, Oh, I am sorry. Uh, the blue is opposition to the government. My, my mistake. Whoops. Sorry. Uh, yes, the blue is opposes the government. The black is supports the government. And the green is nonpartisan. Uh, and so you can see most people thought, whatever media analysis might say, this is, you know, and, and we, th one could argue about these characterizations. I'm just talking about how people perceived the media. Most people perceived all of the media you know, pretty much in the same way as more or less pretty nonpartisan. Partisan. And if anything, they all thought that they opposed the government, which at the time was the centrist civic platform. Uh, they ran that same survey again uh, earlier this year. So no one really has any doubt <laughs> about what TVP is, right? There's no, no beating around the bush. Everybody acknowledges that that is what uh, TVP is. Um, yeah. I really wonder that, that if that there is a certain number of people who believe that TVP opposes the current government, uh, I think they probably checked the wrong box or something. So news broadcasts, as I said, uh, what, you know, there was a, there, there were episodes of uh, you know photoshopping crowd sizes, for example, to uh, to make it appear that the opposition demonstrations were less powerful than they are. Uh, when interviewing opposition politicians, the opposition politicians often wore would wear buttons. It, they do that all the time, buttons to show some cause or another. Those tend to get photoshopped out uh, when uh, when shown on uh, on TV. Uh, this is the sort of thing that that media is doing. I think one of the upshots, one of the effects of the, uh, of the takeover of the public media has been a dramatic change in uh, public attitudes in one important area. I've been mostly emphasizing the consistency of public attitudes, but there's one area where there has been a huge change. Uh, this is a survey that's been run since 1993, uh, asking people their attitudes towards and then listing a long list of foreigners. And what you could see is mostly a decline, except in 2005 when peace was in power briefly. Then the numbers shot up. Back then, they also controlled the media, uh, public media. And then after they lost power, the numbers started to go down again and really following a, a broad pattern, becoming quite low. Uh, and then zing, right up again. Most importantly, the Arabs are now the most uh, disliked group in Poland. They didn't even ask that question five years ago because there were so few 
Arabs, and still are, so few Muslims in Poland, or Arabs, they, they ask here, it's phrased as Arabs in other surveys as Muslims. Uh, it doesn't matter because we're not talking about real people anyway, because there are not actually either very many Arabs or very many Muslims in Poland. Uh, the numbers are tiny. They are tiny, minuscule. Uh, and uh, there basically was no attitude, hatred or fondness or anything uh, towards this group that no, most Poles had never even thought about uh, until the peace propaganda campaign in the up, uh, lead up to this election got going. Uh, and um, the strategy of the party leadership uh, was, well, we certainly we don't want to appeal to anti-Semitism because, first of all, we love Israel. They do. Uh, just yesterday, Yaroslav Kaczynski gave a, uh, a really full-throated, very strong uh, speech praising uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and the policies of the Israeli government and saying this is a model country uh, and we love, we love the Jews. Uh, so the anti-Semitism is definitely still there. Of course, it's still there. Uh, but it has fallen way down the spectrum uh, of groups that you're supposed to hate if you're a hateful person uh, in, in Poland. Um, because it was uh, much easier, safer, and uh, politically expedient to focus on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the Muslims or the Arabs, variously defined. With the media un under control, the, uh, they, they turned to the courts uh, after the 2015 election. Actually, I thought, OK, this is bad, but it's not a catastrophe. In Hungary, it was a catastrophe because in Hungary, the elections uh, that originally brought Fidesz to power also gave them uh, the necessary two-thirds majority to change the constitution. Uh, it was clear that that was not the case in Poland. They did not have a two-thirds majority or anything close to it. So, okay, that's fine. The con they, they, they can't change the constitution, so how much damage can they do? Uh, what I didn't count on is they would simply ignore the constitution. Uh, and, and do it quite proudly. Um, very early on, uh, the constitutional tribunal uh, declared a particular early action by the government unconstitutional, and the government just simply refused to publish the ruling and recognize its legitimacy. Uh, a protest was uh, set up uh, outside the um, Council of Ministers um, n near Wajenki Park in Warsaw. Uh, I feel sorry for these people because they they made they, they did the thing you should never do in a protest and you know saying I'm going to stay here until this fi is fixed because they're still there. Uh, and they're, they're counting the days uh, for the recognition of that particular piece of uh, uh, the particular court ruling uh, from, well, I took that picture in mid-August and it was 487 days, so add another 30 or so. Uh, and it's going to be counting, I fear, a lot longer. Um, the, uh, the, you know, there have been um, quite, a, uh, quite a number of, of protests, uh, obviously, uh, against this, uh, this attempt to take over the court. The most dramatic, uh, I think, came uh, last, uh, last July. Uh, this made international news. You, you may have seen pictures of this on TV. It was truly an impressive event. Um, the, uh, there, there were three laws uh, being pushed forward to, um, to uh, rein in the courts and bring them under government control. And the president vetoed one of them to everyone's shock. This was a president who had been completely passive uh, and subservient to uh, the party leader. Um, yeah, that's what Kaczynski. So the president, Andrzej Duda, vetoed one of these to much international praise and to much praise also from uh, the center and the left in Poland. Uh, it, it, throughout all of that, there was uh, not as much attention to the fact that, uh, that really the key piece of legislation went forward. And that key piece of legislation was one which now allows the Minister of Justice to fire trial court judges, judges on the sort of first, uh, first, in, first level. Uh, uh, and so if you're a judge in Poland now, you are subordinate to the Ministry of Justice. Uh, and your job is in uh, Zbigniew Zobro's hands. The Supreme Court is, for now, still independent. That's what got vetoed. How long that's going to last? And even that doesn't matter because, of course, a case has to go through the lower courts before it gets to the Supreme Court. So it's, it, the whole veto thing is a bit of a charade. Um, so there have been a lot of protests, countless protests over the past year. Uh, there will be more any day now. Um, the uh, new the law, new media law, is going to be um, um, passed, uh, uh, pushed through Parliament, um, probably without any uh, discussions or proceedings. They usually do it that way now. And uh, this new media law is aimed at deconcentrating the media. 
Uh, what they mean by that is basically breaking up the media, breaking up big media corporations. That sounds like a good thing, right? Well, of course, they're not breaking up Tefal Peh. They're not breaking up the state media. Uh, but they're going to break up any other media that might compete with them. So they will be able to say, we have plenty of free media. Look, your, your local town newspaper is still totally independent. Uh, but in terms of any large media corporations that could compete as a source of information and opinion, that's going to be gone. You will see massive protests just like these um, that happened for various causes over the course of the past year uh, with, um, with one possible exception, they've had no effect. So this brings us to the key question, and I want to wrap up here, so I'm going to move through this quickly. The key question of why. What is actually going on here? What is peace doing? As I said, the why has very little to do with the broad trends of, 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 of opinion in Polish society, but it does have a lot to do with the reemergence of a very specific ideological formation. Which, uh, which, is, is, which I don't want to call populism. Okay, this is where I wrap back to my beginning. Uh, th this is an ideological foundation which has its roots in the era of the Polish People's Republic, but is not communism. Okay, that's very important. This is not a return to communism, although some people have said that it looks that way. And in maybe some vague ways it is, but, uh, but only in the vaguest of ways. You know, when, when we see propaganda posters from the Stalinist era, you know, our, 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 our first inclination is to emphasize in our own minds the ideological uh, uh, ex excess of such uh, proclamations. You know, we think nobody could believe in this stuff, right? Uh, and that is certainly uh, partially true. Um, but to, uh, it has led us, I think, to a tendency to imagine the communist era as a time of uh, either top-down indoctrination or pervasive terror uh, or simply political passivity to an authoritarian regime. Uh, what we um, have are only, certainly historians are only just in the past five or ten years starting to grapple with is the degree to which this was, uh, the, the communist rule, was a period in Polish history when the government had legitimate public support, off and on, off and on. Uh, and uh, that legitimate public support probably never was a majority of the population, but it was big. Uh, and, uh, and that has to be remembered. And it wasn't communist. It was for something a little bit um, more specific than that. Uh, people, if they, if they were just looking at their own living standards and being rational, not that I would expect that of any voting population anywhere, but uh, if they had, they, you, know, you would say, well, okay, the Polish People's Republic is doing better for us than the second interwar republic did, and it's doing better every year. And I could bring this forward, and it just gets better and better and better. The country grew. Um, a lot of things, a lot of good things happened. Um, and more importantly, though, there was a symbolic revolution that happened after World War II in Poland. I, I, I don't have a good phrase for this. As I said, I have a bad phrase we can start with. I call it exclusionary egalitarianism which at least has the benefit of both words starting with E, but nothing else much beyond that to be said for it. Uh, but except that it does describe what I'm talking about here. This is not egalitarianism in a sort of Marxist-Leninist kind of way. There's no uh, egalitarian theory behind this. It is instead the egalitarianism of, uh, of, uh, of a small population that doesn't want anybody to deviate too much from the norm, from the mean. In other words, it's the egalitarianism that gets pissed off if somebody gets too rich, too uppity, or will help if somebody gets too poor, right? That you try to have a rough sense of, we're all in this together kind of egalitarianism, uh, but that means that you better not stray too far from the community, uh, but also we'll, we'll help you out if things get too bad. It's, uh, you know, it, it sort of in social terms, it's something that one is familiar with from many different contexts. Related to this was a new politics of identity, but not quite in our 21st century sense of that word. Um, the post-war world in Poland and all of Europe, I think it's fair to say, uh, was characterized by very strong um, sense, senses of us versus them. This, I think, is very much a product of the war itself when figuring out who was us and who was them was a matter of survival. Uh, and I think that this basic dichotomy in the 1940s and 1950s was much more important than the intellectuals' discussions about whether we're talking about class or nation or what sort of how we delineate us and how we delineate them. This basic sense that we need to figure out who we are and then make sure they don't get us. 
Um, and that is something that we see very clearly, I think, in the Polish People's Republic. The ideology of, uh, of Marxist-Leninism was, of course, there. And all the rhetoric of it was, of course, there. But it was, in fact, um, very, uh, it, it came with adjectives. Uh, especially after 1956. It came with adjectives, most importantly, the adjective Polska. Uh, so you have, you know, the, the, not the proletariat, but the Polish proletariat. Not the people, but the Polish people. Uh, always the Polish, the Polish, the Polish. And in fact, uh, that is very much what, um, uh, what came to distinguish this regime. A sort of, it wasn't just pure nationalism, it wasn't a rehash of the radical right of the interwar years, but it certainly wasn't either a, a, a rehash of the uh, pre-World War II left. It was, in fact, a very consumerist culture in many, many ways. Uh, and this is something which uh, scholars are just now uh, beginning to really explore in interesting ways. Um, but it was first and foremost a national society. So, um, oh, and all equally in promoting the nationalism of us was, were campaigns to define them. Uh, they might be the Americans, but that never went over very well in Poland uh, for a lot of complicated reasons. Uh, but, uh, but it certainly could be the Germans and the Jews uh, who uh, were routinely villainized uh, in communist propaganda. So to close up, if we want to position and sort of think about this group, I, I like to do so by thinking of, of an ideological triangle hmm? in which we have uh, liberal modernity on one, uh, one edge of the triangle. We have socialist modernity on another edge of the triangle. And then we have nationalism, tradition, social unity, conservatism, you might say, on the third. If we use this, the post-war era, the immediate post-war era, was characterized by a slight thinning out of the upper uh, part of the triangle there uh, with the defeat of uh, Nazism and fascism sort of discrediting the right in many countries. The Vatican continued to represent this ideological force, although with a toned down uh, voice. Uh, we have the communists representing, I think, during the Stalinist era, uh, the, uh, this edge uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the spectrum. We have almost in the entirety of American politics for quite a long time sitting over here at the other edge, uh, sliding back and forth uh, on that spectrum. Uh, after 1956, this is the key development. The PZPR, the, Pol the, the communists in Poland, uh, they, they don't move, they don't liberalize after Gomułka's rise to power, not, not even though that word is often used when talking about 1956. No, what they do is they slide up the triangle. Right? They are equally far as they ever were from the liberal form of modernity, uh, whether it be in the left version or the right version. But now they have also abandoned pretty much the socialist form of modernity as well in terms of their rhetoric and in terms of their actual policies. And my, uh, my current work on the economic thought and the Polish People's Republic really shows this to be true as well. Uh, now, what happens after 1989 is that they're gone, right? And that whole, that, that whole bit of the spectrum, uh, not spectrum, it's a triangle, uh, the whole part of the triangle is vacated. Now, I, for one, and I think a lot of people felt this way too, uh, felt, okay, that's, that's okay, that's not a big deal. Uh, because, in fact, the country is getting richer. Poland is today richer than it has ever been in history uh, by far, uh, by a lot. Um, you know, we, we looked at charts like this, Polish GDP per capita, uh, the purple lines there on that show uh, the post-communist era. So the communist era did pretty well, but the post-communist era did really well. Uh, and people are much more prosperous than ever before. And they're saying it. So if you ask people, uh, how are you doing, uh, basically, how you doing? Uh, but, but give me a real answer. Uh, well, you find that more and more people are saying uh, that they're doing great. And the colors have not come through, I'm afraid, on the projector. Uh, the uh, the uh, neither good nor bad is a is, a, is remaining roughly the same, but the bad, people saying, my life is not, is going really badly. That is now a very small number. People are doing great. Uh, I mean, it, you know, we, we tell stories about the parts of Poland that are left behind, and those are important stories to tell. But if we're trying to explain things that are happening in the country at large, we are talking about a minority of the population that self-identifies as someone who's having a hard time. And that is a radical change from the way it was in the 1990s. Okay, so any, in any case, um, uh, 
religious uh, attendance also going down, another reason to think that uh, that whole right-hand side of the political triangle was ceasing to be important. Um, but what if we recognize that peace's rise to power has to do with the reclaiming of this, um, of this space, I think we can make a lot more sense of this chart showing what happened to the old Communist Party and its SL SLD, the post-Communist Party, and then the rise of peace. It's exactly the same time, and it represents exactly the same percentage of the population. Hmm? They're appealing to the same ideology. This is not a majority point of view. It is not a point of view which represents Poland. It is not popular, but it does have a good solid 35%, let's say, of the electorate behind it. Hmm? Uh, and so there we see, by positioning peace in the same place that I had positioned the, um, the, the, the Communist Party, I'm not saying that peace is a resurrection of the Communists per se. They are not Communists not by any means. They're anti-Communists. But they are occupying the same place that the actually existing Communist Party in Poland uh, held. And uh, from that position, uh, turning Poland in some very unfortunate directions. So I'm sorry I went a little bit too long. Thank you very much. minutes for discussion, so maybe you want to take, so that's one thing about this room, uh, we used to have an hour and a half for our lectures, we're working out the, the kinks of the new building, um, <coughs> we have to leave the room at one because there's a class at 110. So, so I, I will answer very sh quickly to any very quick questions. Exactly. And then I'll be around to talk afterwards as well. Maybe outside in the corner. Sure. Yes, there's a room down the hall. Got a room next to us. But there is time for uh, for a couple yes. concise questions. Questions. Yes. Uh, so, so, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, so, so many questions that come to mind. But uh, in the interest of time, uh, what can you say, if anything, about what appears to me and many people uh, to be a resurgence of the uh, neo-fascist, perhaps the the ONR, you know, yeah. and and so on, and and how that fits into the big picture because you hadn't really mentioned them specifically, right. but I'm curious. Right. Well, uh, in terms of the uh, so the yes, that is they are there is a resurgence of the uh, uh, or appears to be a slight resurgence of the very extreme uh, right the, the 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 people who are so far extreme that they're not even represented by peace, uh, and uh, I I I I wouldn't want to. The reason I don't want to make too much of an issue of that is, for, is twofold. First of all, I suspect that it's not been so much as a resurgence as a coming out of the shadows, right? Uh, that's the first thing. Um, that I, I don't know that they've been, I, I, I haven't seen evidence that the ONR has had these massively re successful recruitment campaigns uh, to, to, to convince people who otherwise wouldn't have been affiliated with them to join. But what there is happening is that people who have those views in perhaps an inchoate way feel now entitled to say them because they are echoed in the halls of power in Poland. This is similar to what we see in the United States. The other reason that I wouldn't want to spend too much energy uh, on them is that by focusing on them, we then take our eye off the ball. Uh, because the uh, people with their, uh, their, their, their uh, banners watch, walk, marching down the street, uh, as awful and repulsive as they are, um, they are not the problem. They are, they are uh, they're, they're not the everyday big problem that is facing Poland today. It's the way in which the basic outlines of their ideology has become entirely mainstream by, uh, by, the, by you know, on the main television news every night. Uh, and so the, the, the ones willing to actually, in an unself-censored way, say, yes, I'm a fascist, are not the, not the big danger. It's the ones who say, of course I'm not a fascist, but then do all the fascist things that I'm more concerned about because there are a lot more of them. Yes, Kasha. Follow-up question, actually. Um, the self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. That is, because your overall tone was very optimistic in lots of ways about the changes, that the changes is not, if, are if not really. If that was really, optimistic, wow, yeah, we're in, in dark some times. Ways, <laughs> <laughs> Well, because I, 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 before coming here, I had seen this as like sort of really big changes to the right happening in Poland, mm. which you sort of convinced me mm. that that might not be the case, and that's why I view this as optimistic. Mm. But um, because they have won, mm -hmm. even there were very complicated and random yeah. reasons for them to win, mm -hmm. when they are at power, all of that right-wing thing, right, may become 
the self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. So exactly. what you've just said, more fascist things, when it becomes uh, mainstream, it's mm -hmm. almost like this, this kind of new trend can very easily grow into the face of Poland. Yeah, I mean, it, well, it is the face of Poland. I mean, the government, like it or not, is the face of Poland. And, uh, you know, they, 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 and if we see the way the West Europeans are saying, I told you so, of course we can't trust the Poles. Of course they're backward. Of course they're barbarians. Of course they're fascists. Of course they're anti-Semitic. We can't allow them to come into our nice, friendly, liberal European community. We always knew this. It was a mistake in the beginning. See, told you so. This is the most painful part of everything that's happening. Uh, they are the face of the country. And, uh, uh, and so internationally, regardless of what is happening to the Polish population, that is, that is just true. And it's going to have lasting consequences that become, uh, become like a snowball, right? Because the more Poland is internationally ostracized, the more, in fact, people, I think, will turn to uh, anybody who stirs up fear of foreigners. Uh, and beyond that, uh, the uh, domestic uh, degree. I, I think that the jury is out on that. Uh, I, I am... It's the, the one way my Polish friends always tell me that they can tell I'm an American. I do tend to always think it's got to get better. Uh, and and uh, the, yeah, which, uh, yeah, which you're never allowed to admit if you're Polish. Uh, but the, um, the, the, the uh, it does, in f I, I, the, there are not clear signs that peace is gaining in popular support. Or, even more broadly, that the right, broadly speaking, is gaining in popular support. There is shifting between vis different factions on the right. Uh, there, but if we look, if we, if we like, cluster together all the various right-wing political parties, all the various centrist and left-wing political parties, we can see a remarkable degree of stability. Uh, so I, that is, that's what gives me, the, even though they've taken over the public broadcasting, they're not convincing it. They're preaching to the converted and not convincing anyone. Um, having said that, Having said that, um, there have been some indications that maybe some incremental shifts have been going on, and they might be only, you know, uh, they might be only a few percentage points, but that's that would be all they'd need. Uh, moreover, beginning, uh, they're in the process of taking over the schools, uh, you know, massive educational reforms, which were basically nonsensical if you look at them on the surface, created tons of chaos and lots of arguing over whether teachers are being fired or not being fired. And uh, well, what's happening is that uh, there, there's a, a massive turnover, so they can fire and fire all these teachers and then rehire the ones they want. Uh, that's what's going on right now. Uh, this this month and in the months to come. So uh, and, and the new textbooks are not terribly awful, but they're pretty bad. So uh, it, it could be that the next generation will have been raised in a different way, and that could mean long-term very bad changes. Thank you so much for this amazing lecture. Thank you.